Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the final webinar of our 2022 Strategic Serial Farm Results Series. Um, I hope you found the last three webinars useful, and, and I'm sure you're all looking forward to regaining an hour and a half extra of daylight um, that we've been so selfishly stealing from you. Um, but thank you for joining us here today for the final webinar. Um, today's webinar is The Future of Sustainable Arable Businesses, um, and I think it's quite an ominous title. It feels like we're about to put the world to rights in about 90 minutes, and I'll see how uh, how we deal with that. But before we go through some basic housekeeping. So you are all on mute, and we unfortunately, we can't see or hear you. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers or any technical issues, please do put them in the questions box. Um, only we can see that, and it's private, so no one else will be able to see your questions. Um, if you didn't enter your basis and the ROSO points um, when you signed up, you can put your um, details in the questions box as well, including your name, your membership number, um, your address um, and postcode and date of birth. Um, again, only speakers can see that, so that is private. Um, the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available to watch on the AHDB YouTube channel alongside the previous three webinars and a whole host of other webinars that we've been up to. Um, we are scheduled to be here until two o'clock um, once the last questions and final comments have been made, but we could finish earlier. Next slide, please, Kristen. Um, so today's focus, uh, today's webinar is going to be focused around the marginal land trial that's been taking part at um, Strategic Farm East with Brian Barker and David Clark from NIAB. Um, and at the end, we'll be bringing in the other Strategic Farm hosts, David Aglin and David Miller. Um, for an activity based on one of the fields in the trials. Um, we would absolutely love you to be involved in this activity and um, love your input. So again, in the questions box, once you get to the activity for your sort of opinions. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass to Brian Barker, the Strategic Farm East host, who's going to explain the reasoning behind wanting to conduct the marginal land trial um, and a bit of background to the trial. Yeah, <coughs> thank you, Izzy. <coughs> now I start coughing. I have just me recovering from COVID, so um, I might be a bit croaky. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so why have we been looking at marginal land? Well, it's been an ongoing thing and a theme through my strategic farm um, tenureship and my monitor farm um, days when we were looking at it and how to identify parts of our farm that don't perform as well compared to other parts of the farm. And is this due to soil, due to nutrition management, cultivations, or is it just the farm factor or the field factor? And so that's something that we wanted to sort of try and pick into and look at. We're obviously, as farmers, we're, we're bringing a lot of data um, back. We're using yield data. We're getting um, satellite um, NDVI scans. There's lots of data being collected and we're harvesting a lot of data, but how do farmers on the ground actually use this data how do we actually get this data as clean and usable as possible and to make sure that we're interpret interpreting it in the correct manner? And so this is what I was really keen to sort of broach this subject. And luckily, David, um, um, who you'll meet in a minute, um, is someone who, who's, who's got the very similar mindset to what to I, which I have. And marginal land is something that we've got to really understand that it's very like one man's mint till is another man's full till. Marginal is dependent on income. It's dependent on location. There's a lot of things that you can't just compare what marginal land is across across the country. It's very personal and it's working out how your marginal land stacks up on your farm. When we started this process and we were looking at the field that we'll be looking at in a minute or later on, when we first did the exercises, we were looking at wheat prices of 100 and 120, 130 pounds a ton for winter wheat. Well, now that whole metric has changed to 250 plus um, pounds per ton, um, depending on how you marketed it. Um, so the whole psyche and metric is a changing beast, and your marginal land swings up and down the scale depending on that income. And then we throw in the the cost of our inputs, our fertilizers going through the roof. We know that. How can we manage that going forward? And so this is where this whole idea of looking at yield maps, looking at soil data, looking at NDVI and everything else and merging it all together to identify parts of the farm that may not be performing as well. We need to ask the question, is it 
something the farmer can do on his own or do we have to then now change our management except that it's not as good um, at delivering crops is there another income that can be delivered a better return or we just got to manage it slightly differently so that's where from my mindset is is marginal land and we've taken out um, land and put into higher tier and um, we've done that <laughs> for the last sort of 12 years um, so each each time we redo a scheme we look at our marginal land that we think is marginal in the current state of this current market and then we add or remove. so yeah so that's where we are <laughs> me excuse me and um, hopefully David can shed a bit more light he's done a lot more he's done some brilliant work um, it always makes me laugh that he crashed Excel with my yield data um, so yeah hopefully he'll he'll shed some light on what we're talking about and we can learn a bit more about marginal land and what he's been doing Thank you, Brian. Hopefully, we're about we'll to see. seamlessly switch screens. Um, oh, here we go. Perfect. Yeah. So David is the lead on this trial. I'm going to pass on to him to share with you some of the results. Um, again, if you have any questions um, for David, there will be opportunity to ask some questions at the end. But please do put them in the chat box. Good. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Brian. Um, yep, so I'm David Clark. I work for NIA, part of the Soils and Farming System teams based at Morley, so not too far from Brian uh, in Norfolk. Um, I'm going to talk briefly today about what, some of the work we've done last year, which was mainly focused on identifying marginal land um, from the point of view that would these areas be suitable for elms. And then this year's work, which has more gone into the areas that are sort of borderline marginal or have considerable yields, uh, penalties compared to the best parts of the field and how we might be able to manage them differently, both from an economic point of view, but also to deliver on some of the themes of environmental land management scheme, clean water, clean air, good soil health. So just a brief overview, Brian obviously could have done this better than me, but I'll do it, but um, we're focused on Brian's farm, total of 300 for 513 hectares of sandy loam, sandy clay loam soil. With a 12 year rotation, um, with winter wheat, also dry spring barley, herbage grass, which is in for two years, spring beans, and then some spring lean, linseed as well. A typical rotation in the, the table there. We include all 35 fields um, that had yield mapping. Um, so this is a total of 457 hectares. So we focused the whole farm, not just on a couple of fields. And the idea being, can we use Brian's yield maps and some really high resolution field input and um, variable and fixed costs to identify parts of the farm that are performing either very well, but also those areas that might aren't performing well and where they'd be better suited in, in environmental land management schemes under current pricing um, values. So in terms of the yield map data set, you can see it's We've got some fields there that haven't had grass. It's a 12-year rotation. We've got 10 years of yield maps, so Paddy's and Tom Dixon's, for example. We've got 100% of the rotation has been spatially mapped over the last 10 years. Obviously, a vast majority have had a grass, which isn't com or isn't yield mapped. Um, so therefore, we've got a couple of years missing. And then there's things like field trials or combine malfunction that means a couple of fields are a bit lower. But on average, we've got 75% of the rotation has been mapped spatially. Um, so although that's, that's good, our confidence in, in how these fields perform is going to be high. Obviously, there are some missing data and that should be taken into account, particularly if there's high value crops in the rotation, such as potatoes that aren't currently spatially mapped easily. Um, they might obviously, if we just focus on cereals and ignore them, that might lead to a, a skewed opinion. So the first step last year was, was cleaning the data, and this is really, really can't stress how important this is. If you are using yield maps for any sort of on-farm management decisions, uh, cleaning is a vital, vital process. So we've done a very quite simple uh, cleaning process of every yield map. Um, we removed points that were uh, identified as being taken just before or just after or during a turning uh, mechanism. We removed points that the we identified that each individual swath and then removed swaths that were too close to each other so we assume that the header they, these weren't full header whips therefore yield was either uh well it died lower because obviously it wasn't combined the full header whip but actually if so, some of the times the combine tried to overestimate it and correct for this and it was giving us uh, really high value so they were also removed 
and then also outliers so things that we thought were unrealistic 22 tons and zero tons a hectare and that you can see there an example of how that clean yield maps up for us across the whole data set uh, once we take the grass out, we had nearly a million data points. Um, after cleaning, we removed about 15% of these um, and that our coefficient of variation dropped by about 25%. So if we are, are using this to try and infer spatial patterns in yield, this is a really, really important step because without it, uh, it would have been very hard, as you can see, with the coefficient of variation to, to identify areas that are different or from each other because it's just too much noise in that. The next step, again, I'm, I'm running over this. This is last year's work, but again, important for what we did this year is accuracy. And Brian's got a really unique data set that every field has a validated grain, grain trailer way sale yield. So Brian knows exactly how much crop has come off each field. And then obviously we can compare that to the yield maps. And this data is quite unique that we've got nearly 10 years of yield map data. So over 300 um, fields effectively. And we could compare the accuracy of the yield map to the accuracy of actually what was came off those fields and that was quite concerning if we if we were just using this yield map data as a raw uh, data set without doing any adjustments if you can see here the complicated table but i've highlighted an important sort of uh, take-home message is that actually across 171 wheat field year yield maps our average absolute error so this is in, if it's plus or minus uh, what the field was actually recorded is about 0.8 tonnes a hectare, which is quite large when we start to think about nitrogen management and how that might, and also margin current prices that would give our, our our margin error of about £200 a hectare, which obviously isn't isn't ideal if we're trying to make informed management decisions. So really to use yield maps accurately into this sort of data, you've got to have a cleaning set and it's really, really really helpful to have some sort of validation data set to check that what you're working with is an accurate representation of yield and where it's not we can start to apply some correction factors so obviously if we have a recorded total offtake and a predicted total offtake from the combine yields we can make those match up now this is there are some inaccuracies with this obviously we're assuming that the variation is the same across all yield points and that the error is the error is the same across all yield points so the high bits and the low bits but it's our next best thing so it's going to improve on that first step if we hadn't done it although we've got to recognize there might still be the odd error in there so the next step was to try and make sense of the data so we obviously yield maps aren't yield data isn't recorded in the same place each year so we, we created a farm grid these grids were 10 meters by 10 meters squared uh, and each grid we mean the yield points from in that from a given year so each grid square had a year yield for each year and we used a technique called uh, fuzzy clustering but this has also got uh, this has been around for a while but it's been recently developed by Kirsty and Alice and, and Andrew uh, Rothenstead to handle better grids where we've got missing data sets because in the past if you had a missing year you'd have to ignore that uh, grid for the whole time period but it actually can deal with those missing data sets and the idea being if just an example here we've got standardized yield on one year on the bottom x-axis and another year for each of those grids on the y-axis and it tries to find patterns in the data so it keeps working identifying patterns and grouping the yield data by clusters that they perform the same across all years so we can say that this cluster this management zone has performed the same across the last 10 years, therefore we could probably expect it to perform the same going forward. And this gave us a couple of outputs, I've just visualized them here in different ways. The first one is uh, based on yield stability, so we can use a, some reasonably arbitrary uh, categories, so high yielding and stable, low yielding and stable, medium yielding and stable, and then unstable. And you can see how actually if we average those areas across all the years, how they perform, and you can see temporal variation is just as big as spatial variation. So, for example, the low yielding years in 2019 uh, have out yielded the high yielding years in 2018. So we've got a not just spatial variation, we have to try and manage it to that temporal variation. But you can see quite consistently those low yielding areas are always lower than the high yielding areas. Another way we looked at it, and this was an important way of, of you look for Brian to look at the data and make his informed decisions in terms of environmental land management schemes or countryside stewardship schemes, 
is the total margin loss for that part of the field compared to the highest margin part of the field and that's important in terms of management not just from elm schemes but saying well okay we've got areas of this field that are potentially losing over 300 pounds a hectare on average across the last 10 years how can we try and recuperate some of that cost whether it's through management or schemes so just run through one field this is Wallies. Um, this is the data we gave to brian obviously you had the uh, elevation ec and then our clusters so we can say that all these old clusters have performed the same. So everything that's ready cluster one tends to be always high yielding. Uh, all the clusters four, which are these purplish areas, are always the lowest yielding parts of the field. But we can start to add margin data to that. And you can see here that on average cluster four, uh, the mean margin over the last 10 years is about 352 pounds. Um, and then it goes up to nearly 600 pounds for the high yielding cluster. Obviously, uh, temporal variation there based on yields and the crop it's in. Uh, another thing obviously is important to consider is not just financials, but actually where can environmental land management schemes be delivering the most environmental benefit? Um, this is on quite a bit of a slope at Warleys and obviously the river dove down the bottom there. So we can use things like the erosion risk potential mapping from SIMAP to say, well, actually, not only is this bottom corner low yielding and potentially we could get a financial gain from taking it out, actually it's probably uh, at the bottom of a high erosion risk slope at the, just uh, in front of the river, therefore we could potentially be doing the best for the environment by taking this out of production. So we can start looking at that area in a total and saying, okay, the mean cluster is 400, the mean cluster yield performance across the rotation has been 443 pounds. We can compare that to some of uh, Brian's costings for uh, countryside stewardship schemes. So, for example, an AB1, how much it would cost to introduce that scheme, how much it would cost, uh, or how much he would benefit in terms of payments from that. And we can see actually, okay, it, it does vary on year because some you get a good wheat year. Uh, so, if we'd introduced the scheme on after first week, we'd have had a slight margin decrease from the scheme, whereas actually, three or four out of the six years would have seen better uh, margins for that area of land if it had been in a scheme compared to cropping. And then actually if we'd introduced it in, in, when we had that spring green crop, it would have been about the same as, as crop. So it allows Brian to make confident, okay, it may not be a complete margin, you know, it, may, it might perform very similar to cropping, but if there's other benefits in terms of make the field easier to work, time saved, not managing it. Uh, and then obviously the environmental benefit. So those sorts of decisions were went into Brian's uh, decisions last year. Now, the work we have focused on this year, I rushed through that so we can talk about this year's work a bit more, um, was using this data and, and, and Brian hopefully used some of this in, in 2019, um, had about 20 hectares in environmental schemes, using this sort of information introduced 40 hectares nearly into 2023 schemes. But what we realised is, okay, that's the least profitable parts of the farm potentially uh, taken out and put in into environmental management, land management schemes. But actually, there's still over 150 hectares of the farm that had a lead, mean uh, margin loss of over £100 a hectare compared to the best part of that field. So not only is this potentially margin loss uh, of economic importance, Brian, in terms of environmental land management schemes, it, it's not unrealistic to think, well, these are the areas potentially where nutrients are used at least efficiently, therefore where actually if we can manage these differently, where we can deliver the best in terms of the environmental benefits. So, uh, you know, reducing erosion, reducing nitrate list, leaching risk, uh, et cetera. So the project this year focused on three fields, um, barn field, which is B there, top 59, which are the three T's and shrubbery field. Uh, we focused on looking at three or, or six points in barn field uh, in each of these clusters. So these cluster performance, you can see in the line graph at the bottom, uh, we've got three points within those clusters in top 59 and three points within the clusters in shrubbery, although technically S2 and S3 are in the same cluster, uh, as in they perform the same in a given year. But you can see we've got, this is standardized yields across all crops. So how much you'd expect the yield deviation to be. Uh, and just running through them, you can see S2 and S3 tend to be about a ton, three quarters of a ton below the top best performing parts of shrubbery. 
similar sort of level between the top and the bottom uh, top 59 the best and worst performing areas and then barn uh, slightly worse even that that headland certainly down the left hand side nearly a ton and a half average reduction compared to the best parts of the field or even over that two tons when you compare that, that this is above the mean so we're looking at these sites and we identified these sites these sites was chosen because they're very representative of the rest of the cluster so you can see down the bottom there's a bottom right hand corner there's a regression graph and actually every year 85 percent of the variation in the cluster mean can be explained by the yield of at those exact points so we're saying that if we measure soil properties in those points we're potentially or most probably getting an idea of the soil properties in the whole of that cluster so it's a way of using these management zones not only to reduce sampling costs but to try and sort of infer what's causing this variation over larger areas and you can see the graph is just the mean margin loss over the 10-year data set and then the winter wheat yield loss um, across those years so barnfield was in uh, winter barley this year and top 59 and shrubbery were in winter wheat so we carried out a suite of assessments um, mainly focusing on soil and crop looking at what can we identify that's either driving this variation is there anything we can manage differently based on the data we got from this um, so obviously spring soil nitrogen was done to identify how much nitrogen was in the system prior to application we did a full suite of soil nutrients on organic matter including texture uh, potentially mineralizable n bare surf worms bulk density and then we've done some tissue nutrient testing and various agronomic uh, counts grain nutrients with full suite of grain nutrient testing was done on each of these sites and then also we've done a soil nitrogen post harvest and of course used the yield maps for yield mapping so how did the yields in 2022 perform well generally um, they followed uh, the pattern of previous years you can see although uh, little not quite as much variation in barn field as we've previously seen although barn six that headland site on the left hand side uh, considerably lower a ton and a half lower than the high yielding p1 and p2 sites shrubbery was uh, that's in winter barley shrubbery a very good performing year um, and actually the only about a ton reduction in s2 and s3 or even less on the headland site in s3 and then top 59 um, the actual yields on that site it's quite small amount of variation but actually the clusters again showed quite small variation between those areas uh, and this this is really the first graph the important one here is, is comparing how clusters historic yield so this is the, the yield data from 2010 to 2020 performed to this year and what's interest, or interesting but also nice and gives confidence that actually these management zones are quite consistent is that 70 percent of the variation we saw across the whole farm this year could be explained by the variation in previous years so if we'd managed those differently based on historic performance would have got a pretty good uh, match up for previous performance this year so it we would have been managing for historic variation uh, that goes down a little bit when we look at the site yield because of that's only a specific point in that um, field that where we've done all our sampling but still a generally good correlation between historic site yield and cluster yield um, so the first thing obviously the, the the main thing we first wanted to look at was texture uh, you know does texture explain this variation Brian had um, some gamma ray spectrometry done um, by a, a company. Uh, this is using uh, for four radionucleotides and then some targeted soil sampling to infer soil properties across fields. Uh, and you can see there that um, there's a little bit of difference. I've just seen my piece just presented the clay percentage here because if you get a clay sand silt, um, harder to map itself those three properties. Um, but then also our actual recorded soil texture differences at a third north 30 30 60 and 60 to 90 at each of those sites so this is just barn field you can see in the texture triangles at the moment and you can say see that the lower yielding b5 and b4 tend to have a heavier topsoil so it, it, we've got a um, higher clay content or sorry a, a lower clay content that's the wrong way around down the bottom of the field uh, oh sorry higher clay content down the bottom of the field compared to the headland site at B6 and B3. 
the northwest appears to have a slightly lower uh, clay content. Shrubbery field, um, which again is this one on the left there, S1, S2, and S3. Although there was little pockets identified by the gamma ray, uh, generally small variation in clay content across the field, and we pick that up with our uh, soil sampling. There tends to be not much variation in clay, suggesting texture isn't driving the variation we see across the field. Top 59, we did see um, bigger variations. It tends to be a heavier field anyway, sort of some pockets there, nearly 30% clay. Uh, and actually the top of the field and certainly our headland site T3 uh, has a higher clay content, content than the rest of the sites. So I believe if, if you look at the clay content we measured at 60 to 90 in the texture triangle, probably a slight error in the, the lab analysis there. I don't think we're up at nearly 70% clay. But the, the, the take home messages from there really is texture doesn't necessarily explain our yield variation or makes it hard. It doesn't follow our clustering pattern. Perfectly. So we then done our full range of chemical, biological, and physical properties, and then obviously I've included this year's yields against them just for reference. Um, I'll work through these just one by one. I know it's hard, and I've, I've color coordinated these based on the AHDB or College and Health Partnership. Green being all okay based on current recommendations. Uh, orange or, or yellow being maybe worth looking at in a bit more detail, and then red probably needs to be something done about that. Interesting, pH showed some variable, large variation uh, and probably could be benefited by being spatially monitored. Um, shrubbery, again, quite high pH of nearly eight in some of those sites. Um, and then, uh, again, doesn't really follow any yield pattern. So we can't say that the high yielding areas have got a lower pH, et cetera. Uh, and again, that's probably explained by the fact we don't see big differences in, in um, textual differences across the field. The P data, uh, phosphate data is a little bit more interesting and it does kind of follow the trends that we'd expect that the high yielding sites tend to have, apart from the exception of barn there, tend to have higher grain phosphorus, uh, sort of phosphate levels, potentially because our offtake's been lower over the last, historically, you know, potentially hundreds of years. Um, but actually, that's not a, a Brian's farm. He's got confident that this spatial variation in yield doesn't appear, certainly on these three, to be causing big differences in phosphorus levels. So we're not seeing a big buildup of phosphate into index three, index four on those low yielding sites, suggesting that actually managing phosphate spatially across these fields probably won't isn't going to deliver any economic benefits, but it's, it's also not going to um, deliver any doesn't look to be delivering any environmental benefits because we're not having increased risk of uh, phosphate losses on those low yielding areas. Again, no real difference in, in, in potassium. Again, the high, low yielding sites, so six, three and three in, across the fields tend to have higher K. Again, probably explained by that uh, offtake, previous historic offtake. Soil organic matter, interestingly, tends to be higher on the headland sites on barn and shrubbery. Uh, this might be because of they are obviously woodlands, hedgerows, potentially an increase of, of leaf litter over the years uh, might have uh, increased those soil organic matter. <coughs> PMN, again, the, the reason why it gives us some confidence in our organic matter data that the potentially mineralizable nitrogen levels is higher on those higher organic matter sites as you'd expect therefore uh, probably gives us confidence that there is slightly higher organic material in those headland sites interestingly as you'd expect the vest scores this is good news for brian in terms of all the infield sites of good soil structure so that we're not expecting them to be reducing yield but actually we probably identifying what is driving though that yield variation on the headlands as you'd expect uh, and our vest scores are considerably worse on those headland sites uh, six, three, and three. We don't pick up in bulk density, and the reason you know you might like vest scores over bulk density is that bulk density can be impacted by organic matter. If we've got more organic matter, our bulk density is going to go down. So although these areas might be more compacted as we expect in the headland, we're not picking that up in the bulk density because it's been potentially counteracted by the higher organic matter. So yeah, in a nutshell, VES scores were the only real thing that we saw that potentially could be driving yield from a, a standard soil uh, nutrient and biological suite. 
Um, but then there is those messages around P&K to monitor them on low yielding and high yielding sites to see if offtake uh, is leading to some discrepancy there. I just included this so you can see what I mean by the VEST scores. So you can see this is the, the, the picture of the soil structure after the VEST score has been completed. And you can see how the high yielding and all of the infield sites tend to have good soil structure. Uh, and then actually, as we get to these headland sites, we can see the aggregates increase, uh, not to a drastically bad level. This is just looking at the average across all layers within that soil profile. And we're still around about three, uh, which is about the level where you might want to start looking at uh, where root restriction might be impeded. Uh, it was a you can see right there, I've done a number on my wooden spade as well in one of those headland sites. So we've seen that obviously there is the variation. We can't deny the yield maps showing that there's big variation in productivity. We haven't identified anything in terms of soil nutrients uh, that we could potentially be doing differently on those sites. So this is where we started looking at grain nutrients and nitrogen and how that might be impacting across those sites. So I've just included the P and the K here. What I've plotted is our soil P levels measured, and then our grain P in 2022 uh, measured by grain nutrient analysis. And it does say that all sites with an index 1 P showed lower than benchmark levels of grain P and therefore might benefit from further P additions. So if we went back to the previous two slides, you can see these are these orange, uh, or orange highlighted P sites that are down into index 1. And this shows that actually potentially that is impacting grain phosphorus uptake and that potentially if we can increase them to an index two, we might get better at uh, grain pea supply and potentially higher yields. The four sites that had adequate soil pea but lower grain pea, so this is suggesting that although there's adequate pea in the soil, the crop isn't up, able to uptake that, three of these four sites were the headland sites. And this can be explained by the VEST scores. We've got poorer structure, although the soil pea supply is adequate, crop isn't able to uptake that. And then our two sites that had optimal supply also had optimal uptake. Uh, K is obviously slightly different. We had all sites had adequate soil K based on our current indices uh, and optimum grain K based on the current benchmarks, although these are less certain than P. We don't quite know. And there's a bit more variation in what optimal grain K is. A nice demonstration of how doing some targeted grain nutrients can provide a bit more insight into what's driving that variation and how we might manage that. Just going to move on to the nitrogen aspect of the work now, and, and I'm going to briefly bring Brian in in a second. But I basically graphed up Brian's got very, very accurate field level uh, nitrogen application data and field level uh, margin data based on the recorded offtake and the grain sold. And what you can see is, Brian, over the last 10 years, this is across all crops. So this is on average across the farm, how much nitrogen has been applied kilograms per hectare uh, across 2010 to 2020. That's the green dots and the green line. You can see there's been a downward trend. And then the blue line I've included just to show potentially, although there's been a concerted effort to reduce nitrogen, this hasn't necessarily come at the cost of margin, as in we aren't reducing yields and profitability across the farm. Uh, there's no real change. Uh, across that that time frame, I don't know, Brian. If you want to explain a bit more about the rationale between the, the nitrogen redu reduction you're doing. Yeah. So, excuse me. Um, as we looked at it over the the, the the farm's last ten years, I've been actively trying to reduce the amount of nitrogen we're buying and applying, um, just on a conscious level. When you start looking at the different literature about nitrate-filled plants and pest attacks, we're obviously moving to a lower input system so i think in 2015 is when we transitioned from a more intensive cultivation plow and stir the soil up system to um, our tentative starting into direct drilling and strip till drilling and so sort of 2015 onwards is when we sort of been looking at much more tailored approach and much more time spent assessing infield very um the field differences, working out what we felt those crops were actually going to deliver um, before we sort of just tarred them all with the same brush, which was probably was the the, um, the old historical um, plow was all we'll just stick um, 230 on our second week, 210 on our first and carry on. Whereas now we're looking at every single field individually, 
and working out the, where, where we feel that level of, of, of nitrogen needs to be. Um, so we, I've been actively trying to reduce it. It's nice to see that I have actually reduced it um, over time. Um, and it shows that, yeah, as we've learned the, the new system and got the, <laughs> the, the, the big disparities of some, we had some 2016, 2018, 19, there's some pretty wet autumns in there, which were, when you're learning a new system was fairly um, brutal on certain fields. Um, so we, we, we have changed our system and now I've got more confident in applying less. We look back at the field that I did, which was a look-see, which then dro drove the other um, the other um, trial that we've been looking at lowering our inputs when we only put, applied um, 150 kilos of nitrogen on a second week and it delivered 9.4 tonnes. Well, that doesn't happen every single year, but we're much more confident by doing our look-see trials and, and doing field-scale trials that we can actually reduce but maintain our output. And the other um, the other lowering input um, webinar that was on the other day <coughs> would probably back up that, that farmers can be braver as long as they understand the risk associated with it. Um, and it's just nice to see that we are actually reducing our nitrogen applications and knowing how far I can drop it um, and being braver in not just winter wheat but across the rotation, looking at your your spring barley's and your um, winter barley's, how low we can do it, and and as fertilizer prices increase, buying the right fertilizer to make sure that we've um, we're actually getting the most out of these now high cost inputs. Good. No, that's difficult invoice, but um, this is the same graph. This is just for winter wheat. So um, again, obviously the, the previous graph was including, you know, that I might have introduced or introduced legumes. So obviously the nitrogen is going to be reduced uh, across farm because there's going to be some crops in the rotation that don't have nitrogen. But you can see that Brian's achieved the same things as he talked about uh, in winter wheat. So it's gone from, as he said, around about 224. 10 to 200 uh, in 2022. So again, uh, no detriment to the margin as we're seeing at the moment. Sorry, David, to jump in. It's Christian here. Your audio is being a bit funny, so I'm going to turn your webcam off. You can carry on, but that sometimes helps it. So carry on. I'll, I'll let you know if that changes. Okay. Can you hear me okay now? Hopefully a bit better. I'll, I'll let you know if not, better, but you can carry on. Yeah. So. One thing we did do is just a, a, a sort of computer desk exercise based on what RB209 does. Uh, if we if we assume that Brian's historic yield data for winter wheat is accurate across the farm, RB209 suggests that any yields above eight tons a hectare could be increasing. We could increase the recommended nitrogen rate by 10 kilograms of nitrogen hectare for each half ton above that, but also up to a maximum of 13. Uh, tons of hectare, but then also for uh, crops that are lower than this, we could be reducing nitrogen by 10 kilograms of nitrogen a hectare for every half ton. So if we were to apply that uh, across Brian's winter wheat yields, historic, so this is this is all the fields that have got at least five years wheel winter wheat data. There's a couple missing that didn't have it. We wanted to be quite confident what historic average yield was for each of those zones. And this shows that Actually, this wouldn't necessarily reduce Brian's nitrogen rate across farm. His average end rate, as we've just seen, has been 225 from 2010 to 2020. It would, based on the recommendation from RB209, it would be 226, which is, I guess, good for Brian to know that he's, you know, on a, a farm level, his nitrogen rate based on this recommendation is about right. But what it does allow us to do is give those area, higher yielding areas a bit more and those lower lit yielding areas a bit less if that's you know that's what RB209's current recommendation is both for yield and for grain protein. I'll put this slide back in here again because obviously to do this and have confidence in this we've got to be confident that our yield map data is accurate uh, and we fortunately because of Brian's data set have that confidence whereas some people may not. So it really is important to be sure that your yield maps are accurate before you start using them to do things like this, because if not, you could just be uh, sort of working within the area of the yield map data set. So in terms of our six sites, or uh, sorry, 12 sites that we looked at this year, does, does this sort of theory stack up? 
uh, and it does to an extent. So you can see there's the winter barley crops there, which we don't currently have uh, RB2 and our recommendations on nitrogen rates based on yield or protein. Uh, but we N applied is about 180 and 212 in the both wheat fields. Uh, you can see there's very little difference in the spring soil nitrogen. So we didn't see any of these sites having large amounts of uh, soil N or, or increased fertility. Uh, we also didn't see massive amounts in different in tillers or head counts from these sites, suggesting that you know N rate or there wasn't large differences in uptake at, at before nitrogen application. We've put PMN back in there. It's not a direct measure of how much nitrogen is going to be released, but it gives us a general idea of potential for nitrogen mineralization. And as expected, those higher organic matter sites, some of these headlands, uh, have a slightly higher, although it's very hard to currently say how much of that would be available in this crop. We use the SPAD meter, which is a chlorophyll meter on each of these sites. We did over uh, 100 measurements on each site. And the, really, that didn't tell us a lot else. Uh, a lot more information uh, than just generally looking. We didn't see any variation between the sites. Again, with the tissue testing, didn't tell us much. Slightly higher nitrogen on the headland site and shrubbery. And again, the low yielding sites on barn, uh, but again, nothing conclusive. Uh, tillers generally were higher uh, on the higher yielding site, but not really any, any, any uh, different, sorry, heads was higher on the higher yielding sites, but no, general pattern there, till is no different. But what is interesting, again, is our grain nitrogen. So if we think back to the previous slide on, on what RB209 recommends for yield, it was suggesting that those high areas potentially could do with a bit more nitrogen, the lower yielding headlands and other sites could potentially do with a little less. And the grain end data kind of backs that up for this one year's data set. You can see there that our, the only, the, in winter wheat, and cereals, it's a show, um, yield optimum grain N is assumed, is assumed to be about 1.9%. This is 11% grain protein. And the only time we reach that is on the headland site in shrubbery, the headland site in barn. And as you can see, the headland site in top 59 is way above that, suggesting that actually, certainly on top 59 headland, this year is about right on the shrubbery headland, but actually potentially nitrogen was that well above what was that adequate for yield on that cer certainly the top 59 headland and therefore could be reduced. RB209 recommendations are uh, 25 kilos for every half percent reduction in grain protein or increase in grain protein and that actually equates to about an 80 kilograms of reduction is recommended on the headland site. This year top 59 barn actually were about right it was obviously a dry year uh, potentially nitrogen uptake wasn't a, a, uh, certainly drier than normal. Um, so we want to monitor them over a couple of years to say, do we see this pattern consistently that these low yielding headland and low or headland sites and low yielding sites have a high grain nitrogen, therefore potentially we should be reducing nitrogen on those areas as the yield map data would suggest. Uh, and again, slightly low on some of these high yielding sites. I've just included because we've only got it for wheat based off this data, what the nitrogen recommendations would be based on this year's grain nutrient data. So you can see actually plus 24 and plus 45 for the two infield sites in shrubbery and minus 10 for the headland uh, and plus 40, plus 20 on the, the high yielding, but sort of minus 80 on, on the headland sites. So although one year's data, uh, but generally in agreement with the RB209, historically lower yielding areas might require lower nitrogen rates. I know this sometimes can go against some of the other models out there. Um, some of the sensors might look at lower uh, green leaf air and apply more nitrogen. Um, our current RB2 and our recommendations is, is almost the opposite to that. One thing we did have a quick look at is, is Brian got um, eight fields um, done. Uh, so we obviously got yield maps, electrical conductivity scans have been done, but uh, eight fields were also done with gamma ray spectrometry. Uh, these were scanned in the spring of 2022, so this is measuring four radionuclide data and then using reference, geo-reference soil samples to infer soil properties across the whole area. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get hold of the point data um, from the company that does this, but I basically used their Krig maps and extracted what they are saying uh, a certain soil property is, um, and we've used that to against historic yield performance to say, you know, can technologies like gamma ray spectrometry 
explain this yield variation and then help us manage that better. Uh, and this is basically the art message is it's difficult. Um, these are the, the, the eight fields. And here I've got all the soil properties that we or soil physical properties measured by gamma ray spectrometry. And these are the cluster mean management zone yields across the last 10 years. And you can see, for example, back of ash, anything that's green is a significant correlation. So at a 0.5% interval. And you can say that actually at back of ash, these cluster performance can be reasonably well explained by clay percentage. Uh, top 59, as we've seen, high heavier at the top there. Uh, excuse me, can it can the yield variation can be significantly explained by EC and also clay content from the gamma and the sand content. But some of these fields, for example, big lawn, crown, shrubbery, uh, it's all a matter for barn field, but generally it's the gamma ray spectrometry is not explaining that yield variation we're seeing uh, with an individual property. Looking at the soil chemical properties, um, we've got, uh, again, no significant correlation between cluster yield and the uh, cluster measured K. Apart from on top 59, we see that actually K increases where we've got lower yielding uh, clusters. Uh, and then actually on for P, we see a significant uh, reverse trend. So lower P and the lower yielding areas on top 59. But generally, uh, on uh, sort of over half the fields, we don't see a significant correlation to nutrients measured by gamma ray spectrometry and yield performance. So it's very hard to use some of these data to explain yield variation, um, and it's likely to be a combination of soil and that uh, need to be interpreted holistically. And of course, every season is different. So from the first year of, of moving on and actually measuring uh, soil properties and crop properties in these, these clusters, we're going to do the same next year, but on some different fields, just focusing on winter wheat to try and increase the amount of data we've got on wheat. But Generally, the management using clustering as a management zone, 70% of the variation we saw this year could be explained by previous variation. Low yielding sites, particularly headlands, had the highest grain nitrogen levels. And based on RB209 recommendations, N rates could potentially be reduced if this pattern is consistently seen. Uh, and again, broadly looking at the yield, uh, agrees the principle RB209 that lower yielding areas might benefit from reduced nitrogen rates and higher end rates on good yielding areas. But actually across Brian's farm, who tends to be a, a, you know, a good high yielding farm, average yields are 10, 11 tonnes a hectare, these reductions are going to be small in terms of reducing nitrogen rate. Now, if you're on a farm that actually your uh, yields hover around you know, nine tonnes and it varies from five to 10 or whatever across the field, that's where some of these variations uh, might be larger and some gains might be increased. So in terms of going forward on your own farm, I think, you know, using accurate yield maps is, is really useful to getting some of this targeted information and doing targeted soil sampling and certainly grain nutrient analysis together can help potentially identify how some of these lower yielding areas could be managed. That finishes my brief, uh, or Run very quick run through of what we've been doing over the last couple of years at Lions. So I think we're just going to go back to the other presentation just to answer some questions that have come in. So some questions for David: How can more farmers go through this process? Obviously, there's a lot of yield map data around, um, and you're talking about cleaning it. Uh, what's the sort of differences between, you know, actual yield map data, data and then going over the way cells and, and how can farmers sort of harness this and, and sort of start cleaning up their own data? Yeah, so that, I, I suppose that is the main limitation. Obviously, a lot of work's gone into getting them clean and, and using things like clustering. A lot, I will say, a lot of the software out there is, you know, is, is, is certainly fit for purpose. I think, you know, I'm not Brian you use um, Omnia, do you? And that yep. does have a cleaning function on it, I believe. So any any yield map software that you're currently using, if it has a cleaning function, use it. I almost, you know, that's the first step before we do anything, just just clean it as best as we can. Um, in terms of the, the, I think that's where the next step for, for the software companies probably is, is, is they currently, you know, you can 
layer years on top of each other and you can um, you know do a sort of mean yield across the 10 years I think the clustering has a strength that it, it it's a bit more statistically sound but you can then also um, visualize this in a single graph but then also extract the data so I think the next step is looking for that software that can then sort of start to take that analysis to the next level so not just looking at yield maps but how can I correlate that to my EC scans for example you know can I explain this yield variation with some of my other data sets I have uh, and that's where I'm not sure we're quite at yet and that's probably you know not, not necessarily myself but you know uh, the likes of Omnia and, and John Deere and that to, to, to make use and, and show if we can show the value in having that really accurate uh, and, and the, the ability to analyze this data in this way that's when I'm hopefully it will come much much quicker. And in terms also, of having, it's also having the actual actual yield to to validate it as well so we just use trailer wires um and they over when we sell all our grain out they've been very accurate but it allows the combine to be calibrated for every field so we do test ways early mornings evenings um when conditions change and we go from different varieties we'll just put a test way on onto the combine using the trailer wires do a full trailer weigh it radio back to the um to the cab this is what the um the the actual weight is and so we're trying to tidy up those yield maps right from the start um to make sure that we're getting as much as we can out of a a useful um thing that we've all paid for on our combines um and it's just i used to print off different colored maps one which had nice green areas for my dad and then i would then look at the ones which had the big red marks on which were ones which i adjusted the um the, the levels for um, where we got our actual net margin was actually negative. So, yeah, there's different ways around it, but that validation of data is key. And I think. So I think. Oh, sorry, come on, David. I was just going to say, the, the, even if we don't have those steps in place, or you know, even just looking at, I think the value what we've seen at Brian's this year is just having some idea. You know, I've got this variation going on. I don't think we're at. A, point where actually just going and doing some targeted soil or targeted grain nutrient analysis can be beaten. I think if you've got an area that you know is low or, or a headland, you know, go sample three or four low performing headlands for grain nutrient analysis at 10, 15 pound a sample, you can quite quickly get an idea of how your nutrients are being used efficiently. And, you know, it's important to have the soils data with that. But, you know, you, you just focusing on a couple or three of the four typical headlands might give you a, a, an idea across the farm how those elements are performing and, and whether you might want to do something differently. I think you both might have answered this next question but I'll, I'll just ask it anyway. So before you had David and as a farmer um, what are the three things that you would have time to do? Brian this is for you. Oh you're on mute. Can you just repeat the question? I was just about to cough. So <laughs> before you had David um, and you you were starting to sort of look at these fields and, and notice you had variation in things. What is the three things that you would have had time to do that you would have focused um, on? I mean, one of them you were saying just then was was the accurate sort of um, weighing all your trailers. Yeah. So before I was lucky enough to have this whole thing um, done by David, I was making sure that as my data came off the combine. It was then saved in the raw format because as soon as you put it into a program it then is useless so make sure you always take a copy of your raw data and that's then kept so if you then change programs or you need to import it into something else it's a lot straightforward than getting old information out of old programs then when i was looking at how i was doing it before um, we looked at it and obviously before omnia um, omnia is obviously a paid service um, i was then just literally printing out and doing spatial looking at different years, but making sure that the scales were all right. Um, so making sure that the scales for all the color coding was right. Then that would then allow me to identify different parts of the field that were low, low, low. And then that's when I would then go out and do a soil test, go and get my spade out and dig, look at drainage maps, look at all those sort of things. So it's, yeah, if you've got the ability to look at yield maps, make sure you try and standardize them as carefully as possible also take a lot of notes through the season um what you saw what the conditions were because again weather conditions change dramatically um and so you need to really <laughs> understand what's what's going on um so yeah so i would say make sure you save all your raw data 
make sure you try and standardize the scales and clean them up as best you can with it, whatever program you can. If you can then use a program that merges them, all well and good. If not, get your crayons out, get your pieces of paper out, get a gin and tonic one night, pick a field, go into depth into that field, and then pick some areas that you can actually get your teeth into and go, right, I'm going to soil sample that. Don't do just the, the easy, cheap, um, basic soil analysis. Spend the money on really detailed soil analysis because that will give you much more information that you know that you can then act upon. And then you've just got to look at using the advice or different things about how you can improve, or you just got to say, well, actually, that's just not a good, a good area of the field. What else can we do with it? Yeah, absolutely. And I like what you just highlighted, not just saying historically this bit's been underperforming, but why, why has it? And that's when you go into this targeted sort of soil sampling. Um, so another question is, can we access this report um, anywhere to share around with colleagues um, and farmers? And there are previous um, year results of this report um, and this year's results on the HDB website on the Strategic Farm East page. And also, if you type into the search box on the website, um, marginal land, it will come up with um, a whole load of articles that, that have been done, done on this because this trial has been going on for the last two years, I think. Um, Brian Barker is now in his final year as a strategic farmer. Um, and you're not allowed to do that on camera. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, we've got another year doing this trial. So what is next for this trial then? Sorry, on mute. Um, so, so we're we're doing much of the same. Obviously, we've we've got a one year. It's probably not enough in terms of the uh, soil and grain nutrients to say this is what you know. We definitely could be doing something differently on these low yielding areas. We realise having the barley. You know, actually, the majority of Brian's nitrogen use and uh, farm is in wheat in, in most year. That's his primary crop. So we'll, we'll focus all all twelve measuring points on wheat. We're going to keep some the same. Uh, in the same fields, I'm going to move to some other fields. Say, actually, do we see the same patterns across different fields? That, that again, you know, in, um, uh, we identified 157 management zones across the whole farm. I'm not saying we should probably measure. You know, Brian's not going to go do a soil and grain and nutrient analysis on every single one of those. But if we can pick 12, 13 that are represented across those spectrums, we can then potentially imply what's going else it, it, across the farm. So yeah. Much the same, but on sort of 12 sites in a wheat crop, um, we've again trying to capture that big variation high in low yielding areas. Yeah, and then I'll be from a from a farms looking looking at can we actually probably do a look see trial that we can add on to the side of this would be taking a, a field, splitting it in half, doing our standard nitrogen approach, broad spectrum, nothing too fancy, but then could we actually reduce our headlands? Is there a saving to be made? Um, looking at each year is going to be different. Um, and then saying, well, actually, do we take the, the bit that was going to be potentially wasted on the headlands? Do we then add that onto our best bit? Um, so we're sort of looking at how we can do a, a split field trial or just a look-see just to make sure that there might be something for future strategic farmers um, across the country or current ones across the country who might be able to take this further forward. Um, and looking at nitrogen um, usage and, and how we manage our crops um, independently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is that you volunteering to do another six years? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question for David. Um, would this ever work in grassland in a grassland setting with much rougher grass growth data? So, it's not the same in terms of what I'm about to say, but like Brian had his uh, herbage grass seed, which he did yield map, but it, the data was much much noisier. I don't I know I don't know what sort of yield mapping capabilities you have with silage or grass. Um, obviously, you've got you'll be more reliant on satellite data in terms of NDVI and biomass estimates from that. Um, again, I, you could probably uh, currently, you know, I probably wouldn't be advising you, you'd be using that data such as NDVI or biomass from satellites to then go do some hand harvests or some hand sampling to say, well, actually, you know, this is probably what's going on in these areas. This is how I might manage it differently. Um, it's, it's more about getting that ground, ground truth data and using that spatial data to, to actually make decisions. Because I think on its own, you know, satellite drone yield maps 
without having that ground truth soils and 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 grain nutrient data can be you know the, 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 they're you know they're, they're as good as they are limited but and, again i'm 100 sure on the what sort of data sets you would have for that yeah i was just thinking about talking about yield um monitoring with the the john deere harvest lab i don't know if you've heard of that i think that might be a the next step for grass grass um, growth monitoring and, and things like that. Um, uh, another question. So, what is how far off are yield maps from your sort of weighbridge? Is there sort of what sort of tonnages we, differences were you seeing with Brian Barker's? So uh, the average the average error across ten years of winter wheat was 0.8 ton the hectare. So that's if you average the error, as in some years they were higher, some years they were lower, actually it was smaller. It was about 0.2 tonnes because you've got some years it's overestimated, some years it's underestimated. If you took the absolute value, so you said this year it's underestimated by 0.6, that's 0.6. This year it overestimated it, 0.6, it's 0.6. The absolute error was about 0.8 tonnes a hectare in winter wheat. Some of it was it's slightly better in, in some of the barley crops, some other crops that Brian doesn't have been grown just here and there, it was pretty poor, but that's probably because it wasn't calibrated. They were just one or two fields, so we excluded them from the analysis. Some years it was worse than others, uh, potentially driven by moisture content. You know, if we've got a wet harvest, moisture content's higher, there's, there's something else there that could be causing errors. Um, but certainly the errors were big enough that actually to apart from using it to, you know, if we assume that the spatial patterns in yield are correct, that's still very useful information that you can then go go around truth, but to actually do quantified analysis on errors of 0.8, one ton are going to be a bit large to then make informed economic decisions on because we're starting to talk about two, 300 pound differences, which is when we're talking about environmental land management schemes that may only be paid that amount, you're being paid for the magnitude of the error. So then it becomes harder to make those decisions without having that confidence in what the, the data is saying which brian fortunately has through his foresight over the last 10 years of what he's been collecting yield maps that's are getting that, better yeah uh, that's really interesting because the technology like you said it'll be moving on um each year won't it getting better and yeah. better but it's so I, definitely I, sorry Karen, I will, I'll just say quickly that this has been i've written this up for a paper and looking as I was doing that I was looking at other studies that have done similar things nowhere near to the extent Brian had that you know they were looking at two or three fields and they were reporting similar sort of errors of about six percent so this is this is not just Brian's unique case this is other other studies that have done this sort of work have reported similar sort of errors so I'm pretty confident it's probably the sort of error you'd likely see across most of your map data sets. Yeah it's really interesting um so we're just going to move on um, to our activity. We're going to bring back David Aglin from Strategic Farm Scotland and um, David Miller from Strategic Farm South. Um, like I said, any questions, um, please do put them in the chat box and continue um, that flow of questions coming through. So if we just move on to the next slide, we're just going to introduce the activity. So David and I sent away the Strategic Farm host some homework to do um, on this field in question that was part of Brian Barker's trial. Um, I'm just going to pass to David to introduce this activity um, and then we're going to hear from both the strategic farmers and Brian Barker and hopefully some of you guys might have some input as well. So over to you David. Okay cool so I'm not too much so what basically what Brian and, and the two Davids have received is, is shrubbery field which we've heard about a bit already uh, and the clustering results is on the left there so you can see there's five zones of yield performance that's how they're for we're just focusing on winter wheat here this is the winter wheat across the last six years of performance and then you've got the average yield there for each of those zones and the average net margin across the for those zones across the last six years of wheat data um so the question to david and brian the davids and brian's would be so should we and how would we manage this differently you know whether it's environmental land management schemes or whether it's through our um agronomic management this variability now brian has made his own opinion and you can see by the satellite image he's done something already so i don't know if brian wants to introduce the field a bit more than i can uh yeah so this historically <coughs> is shrubbery field um and we being in our higher tier we looked at how we could um 
to use the different bits of the field. So there is a section um, to the right of it, which is um, in grass, which is the little nub that comes out the side. And um, that was underneath the pylon. There's uh, one pylon you can just see, which we used to drive around and cultivate around and combine around. Um, and so with that's been taken out, that got taken out and has been out of the field for um, getting on for 12 years now. And that's been in long term um, flower rich grass. The brown bit on the other side is what we've taken out recently, um, which obviously is more um, land off the back of what we had seen on a farm level from farm management. And then obviously David's clusters had, had identified it. Um, so that's what we've taken out and had in um, bumblebird mix. We've had it in wild seed mix. And then it'll be coming into uh, grass, um, a strip of grass around, around the edge of the woodland. Um, but that's mainly due to the shading. Um, and, and obviously things like that. So that's what you can see on the <laughs> on the on the screen. But it'll be interesting to see what and if, if the two Davids have any other thoughts. Um, I won't sort of go in and steal their thunder too much. Um, but you can there's some there's some fairly obvious things that they might highlight um, and and see if they come up with the same things as what I would. Who wants to go first? Which David? Oh, go on then. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, oh, we've got a basic set of data here, and really visually, what stood out for uh, me, Brian, was the the end rig or the headland, as you guys call them down there, um, on the bottom edge of the field. And something I've done in the past um, quite successfully is just change how we operate in a field. So. You know, traditionally, we always tend to cultivate a field or sow a field the same direction, and all the compaction ends up the same places every year because that's always a, the same turning spot. It was actually that southern end of the field, if you basically work that in a left to right direction, you might give the bit that appears to have more compaction on it um, a rest. For a couple of seasons and allow it to recover and boost its output and yet yeah, okay yes you will move compaction elsewhere in the field but maybe just by moving the turning spots around or even putting in a double end rig um, for sowing you don't have to have a double end rig for sprayer and such like it's just the, the, the turning and the heavy equipment that, that seems to do the damage in my experience and that might just move it around sufficiently that you boost your output um, to, to lift the margin on those areas. Um, I don't know enough about your ELMS um, schemes to, to know what you would, what other options you'd do. We, up, personally up here, we've got livestock, cattle and sheep on the farm. So anything that's an awkward corner is right for putting in some grazing system that we can chuck cattle on for a day or two if it's near a grass field and, and perhaps um, do some good in that fashion. But I suspect you guys don't have livestock, so that's not an option. But that's really all I can come up with. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to teach you how to suck eggs, Brian, because you've probably thought of all this yourself. Uh, do you want, well, I'll, I'll reply to that. Yeah, no, I totally understand what you're saying with that. Uh, I don't know if David Miller, have you got anything else that you would like to highlight? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think I, I certainly agree with what David has already said. I think uh, um, you run the danger of um, you know, if you did something different along that headland in the way of a, you know putting the margin in or whatever, you're still going to run the issue of whether you just move that compaction. We're assuming that's compaction. Um, if you're just going to move that into the field a little bit, um, but uh, I mean we there was another slide I think David Clark but with various other bits of information. Yeah, the next, next slide. Um, I don't know, I'm um, not in charge of that at the moment. Which sort of just made me think, looking across there, if you look at the organic matter, that corner is actually really good compared to some of the rest of the field. Is, is, am I reading that right? That's uh, that's according to the gamma ray spectrometry. So I'm, I'm not here to comment on the accuracy of that, but yeah, if we, if we believe everything we see there, that we'd suggest that that lower yielding bottom right hand corner as we look at it 
um, has higher organic matter of about 3% compared to the rest of the field of about 2.5. Um, you can see that that is cluster 4. So actually, our, compared to the middle of the field, we tend to be about 200, 200 pounds a hectare, or about you know, a ton over a ton reduction in that corner in wheat compared to the middle of the field. So I guess there's a question there for both Davids. If you, know, if you close your eyes and on any other field in the country, knew there was a one ton yield reduction, would you do anything different? What could you do different? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm just going to probably throw up more questions than, than answer for you, Brian, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, I think if the organic matter is higher, then potentially um, you should have a, a, a better soil there. So if, um, I think the other issue that, that Izzy said you've got down there is you, you've got black grass down in that corner. <laughs> Just the one one plant from what she said, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean that's a that's a fair indication that the, its soil structure, if you've got you know plants that like moist conditions rather than dry weather plants. So um, yeah, if, what would we do? I think if if we looked at that, we'd probably um, pull that out into a spring crop and put a, a pretty serious cover crop in there to to just try and help with that compaction. I mean, land drains are something I haven't dealt with for 25 years probably, but uh, it, um, that would be a good indication as to whether you're getting the water down to the drains or, or whatever. So, um, you know, looking at all the other values, if we if we take all the other values you've got there at face value, um, there's nothing really that, that jumps out that should be affecting it to that degree. Um, phosphate levels were pretty good. I, whether there's a, an issue with your know, avail, availability of the pot, uh, the phosphate in there rather than the actual levels, um, yeah, more questions and answers. Yeah, no, then that's very similar to what we have felt that that corner has actually got its own drainage system as well. Um, so is that just a older system? Um, one thing that one topic I was wanting to look at in my strategic farm day and someone else might be able to pick it up is now the efficiency of these 25 year olds or older drainage systems with plastic versus clay pipes with um, stoned versus not stoned now they're getting to the point where are they getting to be need to be changed and is there a much more better way of doing it so drainage for me going forward is something that on our heavier land sites which are all drained we need to be looking at the efficiencies of these things because we've been stuck them in the ground my grandfather and my dad drained the whole farm um and my dad's now what 77 so they've done their tendership and they don't own it very much some are still running um but now plastic and, and good stone is there roots in there we've got to be, do a bit more investigation but is it just a system that's now aged um, and that's causing it to be damper on top to when we do play around with the surface we get slightly more compaction on the surface we don't really know um, management wise when we did this topic when we, we have thrashed this field about several times and we've actually looked at using the two top and bottom and having actually permanent um, turning headlands and this was an idea brought to us in the monitor farm um, days where we were to say well actually <laughs> When wheat price was low, oh, we just best to farm the very best square in the middle because you could put a nice big rectangle over the the red and the yellow um, clusters, and you could just literally drive your sprayer and on a control traffic system through a straight line. You'll switch on, come out the end of field, switch off, turn around on the grass at the end. The two turning grass at the end doesn't have to be in a scheme. You could graze them with your 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 roaming sh sheep flocks um, when required. And then the bits down the side, which have the pink areas, which we've taken out. So you look back at the, the, the other um, picture. You could have that in a stewardship scheme. And then obviously we've already cut the side off one side, but then that other, the, the lower yielding um, foot area, that could be put into a scheme. Um, but that all changed when the price of wheat changed. And this is where the whole debate about marginal land becomes very, very fluid and mobile because the value of land output is very dependent on how much wheat we can get returned. And if, and as David says, yeah, I'm lucky enough to to have a high yielding farm um, <laughs> inherited to me. Um, 
and picking up from where my dad and my grandfather have been. But I'm, but at times I've questioned parts of my field when the prices were low, when costs are high. We're going to be in a point soon that we're going to have a low yielding season with high input costs. And that's what we've got to prepare for. And we've got to be very fluid in how we manage our crops going forward. And that's something that is very mindful in my management. When I'm looking at fertilizer prices this year, last year, I bought quite well. This year, we're all driven by the prices on the farm desk at the moment. And we've got to look at, yes, crops have come out of the ground very well um, in our area. And the, the autumn's been kind and, and they've got away with nice warm autumn um, growth. But we've got to be mindful that at some point, the disparity of as our um, inputs keep rising with inflation, at some point, our yield and our market may dip off. And that's the year that we've got to be very careful about how we manage these areas. And so we've got to be mindful short term income, possibly. We're looking at things like the, the lens, the landscape enhancement network, paying short term um, funding for um, cover crops for long term lays. Um, there's money out there from the private sector. Um, so we've got to be able to look at different income streams, biodiversity, net gains, a bit more long term. Um, but there is, there's more income out there than just stewardship schemes now. And farmers have to go out there and, and really bid for how much money they think they can get for some of these marginal areas. Another thing that got touted about was trees and solar parks and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, that's great. That's long term. But once it's in those sort of schemes, it will never come back to farming. And it's how you view your farm asset is how you've got to really look at those long term things. A question, Brian, how flexible is your um, setup on the farm? So if you're taking out a proportion of your farm on a variable basis, based on what you've just described in terms of good years and potential bad years do you uh, is your cost structure such that it doesn't it's not too you can cope as it were or do you feel you have to crop as much as you can to pay yeah, the bills we, essentially we're still very much driven by we have to farm as much as we possibly can but you've got to be pragmatic of some areas just don't deliver and we don't have the resource to really put our time and effort into some of the really worse areas one thing that i've challenged our farm personally is to go and get as much um, external income from contracting from the local area so i can offset my machinery to cover my area quickly with the system that we're looking at with direct drilling and, and strip tilling that is very niche and short windows i've then picked up enough contracting work that i can then have the size of machines that can cover the ground quickly on ours, but also our contract area. Um, so we, we've got a higher fixed cost sitting there, but we are offsetting it against external contracting work. Um, but it all comes down to that we this attention to detail. And we've got to look at every field in, in isolation, but then also we've got to look at it as a, a farm scale to make sure that we're not carrying too much fixed costs. Um, and making sure that we've got the, the area to spread it over. So that's where the benchmarking comes into it, um, machinery reviews, um, taking the good advice. Um, and we're lucky enough to have all these trials going on that sort of allows us to chew the ear off um, PhD students when they decide to um, to come and interest the subject about it. Um, so yeah, so that's where we, we're, we're fortunate. But yeah, we've got to be mindful as a business going forward that we need to be aware of the level of fixed costs we're carrying compared to output and make sure that the the input costs don't run out too far um, to maintain our output. I think you might have just answered part of this question, but again, I'll ask it anyway. How fluid, this is for you, Brian, how fluid can your management be? Are you thinking year to year or over the whole rotation? And how flexible can you be when schemes are five years long? Because you have just entered into the new 2023 schemes, haven't you? For some, some of the A, B, A, wasn't it? Yeah. So we, we've we've added um, a, a big chunk of I think it's about another 18 hectares into our higher tier scheme. That's looking at the farm in total. Our previous higher tier was only covering about two thirds of the farm, so we brought the whole farm into it. This is off the back of not just this research, but also research done with the integrated pest management. 
saying that linear species rich grassland wildflowers brings a whole wealth of beneficial insects and, and um, IPM um, integrated pest management um, to, comes onto it. Um, so we've looked at that research that they that NI have NI have done and the other webinar talked about it. Um, and so we've introduced a lot more species rich grassland because of the amount of insect life that comes onto the farm with it. When you're looking at BYDV, aphids, all this sort of stuff, by having multi-species grassland, it brings a, a huge number of beneficial insects um, to it, to the party. Your money spiders, your lace wings, your hoverflies. These guys are the good guys which we want. So we we put our we've always stood up and put our head above the parapet with the environmental side being really ingrained into our farm, and that's something that both myself and Patrick. Uh, my cousin are very passionate about that we need to really understand the impact that our farming system is is having on our landscape so by introducing species rich grassland by introducing native species introducing wild seed mixes buffering our water courses it's making our farm landscape much healthier because then in the long term we're not going to have these five-year schemes from the government. These are going to be phased out, in my personal opinion. And so when you're looking at how we're going to be looking at funding these areas, they're going to be from private sectors. These are going to be from income from elsewhere. And so we need to be showing that we can deliver really high-value habitat to make sure that we get the returns for the bigger scale. And if it benefits my farming system with integrated pest management, brilliant. And that's what's a big tick in the, tick in the box. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if David or David, you have any more comments on that? Because uh, you don't they, up in Scotland, you aren't on the same schemes as us, are you, David? And, and you've had you haven't had much um, news on your end of what's been going on with these environmental schemes going forward. No, we've we've um, whether you like or don't like what you guys have got in the south, we've got absolutely nothing going forward, so we have no idea what's going to happen. Um, and they reckon it could be. Now a couple of years at least before we start to get proper information, which is a bit concerning. Mm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, I don't think we have any more questions um, from anyone else or from the audience, unless any of you guys got any questions. Um, we'll probably just wrap it up there. So yeah, so I think that was brilliant. Thank you all for coming um, to this to the um, to the webinar, um, and I think it's just been really brilliant to hear what been going on with David and Brian over the last two years and like I said we've got another year um, of this trial and so it just really brings back the questions are you using your yield map data properly um, are you actually cleaning it obviously we've seen that that makes quite a large difference um, and if not um, are you taking into account what was it 0.8 tons a hectare David difference between yield map and um, what's going over the Weybridge um, and then where you are having these sort of unproductive areas, really getting that sort of soil analysis, detailed soil analysis, soil analysis and crop analysis done, um, which is just helps identify poor, poor areas um, and just really making the farm work hard. And I think that's what you're doing, Brian, aren't you? Sort of getting good balance of, of chasing margin rather than just yield um, and also providing environmental benefits. Um, I think I just, just as I was going to say, I think there's just a question that's just come up. Um, Paul Bryan. Um, sorry. So uh, it's for Brian again. Uh, great to hear, Brian. Where can we find out more about your IPM approach using environmental scheme? Um, that will all be on the HDB website. Um, Aoife O'Driscoll and the NIAB team have been leading their version of the ASSIST project. Um, which they're looking at species found in our, in our wildflowers. We've got three fields. One has nothing, it's just business as usual. One's got six meters flowering margin around the outside, and one's got six meters around the outside and one through the middle of it. And they're assessing the impact to the farm, but also um, pests of slugs, aphids, and if there's any ingress of um, grasses into the field, and then looking at the metrics and any. <laughs> any reduction in yield on those fields. This was done on um, Strategic Farm West at Rob Fox's when he was on there on ours. And I think David, one of the Davids is having it um, done up um, or, in, or similar stuff done 
on another one. So it's an ongoing project from the, from the um, AHDB's Integrated Pest Management, but it should all be on, on the website. And there was a webinar, I think, two, three weeks ago, um, which carried on a very long time because Aoife and Patrick do like to talk about insects <laughs> and everything. So yeah, that's, it's a fascinating subject and something that we, we've been very mindful of that now we our first port of call for any pests is understanding that your beneficials, insects, cycle much slower than your pests. So your aphids and your slugs populations will go very quickly because they can multiple multiply up very quickly, but your beneficials multiply very slowly. So you need to have more of them at the start. And so that's why these habitats are key. Yeah, so as Brian said, um, the webinar was two weeks ago, um, and that is already on the AHDB YouTube channel. So that has all the information about uh, the trial going on at Brian's and um, at the other strategic farm hosts. There's also um, information from Rob's trial from when he was a strategic farmer. That's also um, on the AHDB website. So just bring you to the fact that we are recruiting for a strategic cereal farm host in the West Midlands, Wales and East Anglia. And if you want to join David, David and David, you also have to apparently be called David. So um, we are recruiting and, and if there's something you're interested in or if there's something you know someone would be interested in joining, then um, please sign up online through the link at the bottom or contact me if you go onto the next page, Christian. Um, here are all the contact details from your regional contacts. Obviously, I didn't even introduce myself at the start. Um, I'm Izzy Eames, I'm the North East um, Sales and All Seeds Knowledge Exchange Manager. So if any of you are interested in um, becoming one of our strategic farm hosts in those regions, uh, please do shout out um, and we will get back to you and give you some more information. But that just leaves me to say a massive thank you to all our speakers um, for joining us today. Um, and a thank you to you all for joining for these four series, these four webinars in this series. Um, and if that's everything, um, I'd like to say thank you and just wrap up there.